Hey, welcome to another episode of the Coffee Break Podcast, where our mission is to share business ideas, practices, and strategies while we enjoy our coffee. Today is a fun conversation. We meet up with John Siegel. He's the CEO and Executive Vice President of Brevo, who is a manufacturer of uh, electronic access control products. And while that is relevant, it's not at all what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about an understanding of how to uh, think differently in the marketplace, not just think about how the economy is affecting your direct business, but thinking about how it's affecting your customers and your customers of your customers. It is a opening, eye-opening conversation that we're going to have with John today. So you might want to grab a pen and a paper if you're listening while you're driving uh, get ready because John is going to drop a, a ton of information. There's a little noise in the background because, hey, it's right outside of Brevo's headquarters where he's at uh, cr- during their conversation, they're doing some construction, which is a great sign, uh, but there's a little background noise there. But don't let that throw you off because there is lots of good information and great takeaways for you throughout the conversation today. So grab your cup of coffee and get ready. We got so much to say. We got a podcast to make. We're sipping on lattes, and it's time for a coffee break. It's time for a coffee break. All right, John, thank you very much for being here today. Um, As we do with every podcast, we start with five rapid fire questions, randomly selected just to get under your skin, and they have unknown point values. So that just makes it even more complicated. All right. Awesome. All right, here we go. I'm ready. Question number one. What's the most embarrassing moment from your teen years? Oh, God, from my teen years. Um, I think it's probably when I was a, 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 a little kid. I mean, I'm a teenager, but I was close. And uh, throwing rocks in the parking lot, and I hit one of my classmates. <laughs> and I went to a Catholic school. So naturally, I got hauled into the principal's office, and they wanted to know, why was I throwing rocks at Roseanne? And uh, of course, I really wasn't throwing rocks at Roseanne, but yeah, I got a lot of trouble for that one. That's off the top of my head, the best I can come up with, Jack. So, so basically, John, you like to throw rocks at people. That's very interesting. Right. I'll keep that in mind. Uh, what's the best knock knock joke that you know? God, I don't even know if I know any. Uh, I would say pass on that one. I think I fail on that one. You don't have a knock knock joke? I don't think so. No, not, no. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Uh, Let's see here. Um, If you could be one superhero, what superhero would you be? Chuck Norris. Is Chuck Norris (laughs) categorized as a superhero? He is in my world. (laughs) I think that is the best superhero question that I've ever, (laughs) ever heard. Uh, Did did you know that Superman wears Chuck Norris um, underwear? (laughs) (laughs) That that would be your equivalent of a knock knock joke, right? Exactly. Uh, I, I can do Chuck Norris jokes, but I don't know about knock knocks. Number four: Would you break the law to save a loved one? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I would. Ah, I, I see. See, you, you seem like you just follow the the rules all the time, though, John. No, you know, here's a, so here's a story from high school. I was, uh, you know, you had those little silly uh, things in high school which you're voted. You know, whatever no. most, most uh, likely to succeed. I was voted class rowdy. Really? Yeah. So you know, a lot of people are surprised by that. <laughs> High school superlatives. That makes me laugh. I need to go back and. That's funny. I need to go back. Look at and, your and high and school yearbook and see what you were voted in high school. It's probably something very different. Yes. And then last question number five: Who has has who has had the greatest impact on your life? Uh, great question. I think probably my my dad. Um, you know, I think both my mom and my dad um, set awesome examples uh, for us as kids and uh, uh, working hard uh, every day, uh, bringing all you have uh, to uh, your life, and then also uh, including family and the importance of friends and family. So I, I think my my parents. I would say it's I think you say it's a tie there. But, um, you know, certainly my dad was um, was influential and, and all the stuff that he did. And, you know, as a kid, he always 
you know, he was involved in all of our activities. You know, he was, uh, we wanted to do scouts. So he became part of the scout leadership and went on all the camping trips with us and did all that kind of stuff. And I think only when I got to college and I, and I heard some stories about some of the people I met in college and I realized, you know, my parents didn't play golf. They didn't play tennis. They didn't, they didn't have the hobbies that I hear people all talking about. Yeah. And then I realized the reason was their hobby was the family. Oh, wow. Um, and that they, they spent all their time really um, supporting the family and they gave up really their own personal lives and their own personal hobbies for the family. So uh, I'd have to say those are definitely personal heroes. Very cool. Uh, well, congratulations. You passed rapid fire. Uh, the last answer, just incredible. So uh, we're going to give you a score of 913. So congratulations. Excellent. Great. If I can only get my credit score up that high. <laughs> <laughs> no correlation whatsoever. Right. Very, very cool. So John, uh, the, I guess another question I could have asked you, because I think this is one thing that you and I both have in common is people struggle with the pronunciation of our last name when they look at the spelling. How, how many times a day do you have to tell people how to pronounce your last name? Uh, all the time. And I'll tell you a funny story. So um, when I was in, in grade school, uh, this, maybe this was my most embarrassing moment, but I remember distinctly being in grade school. And, you, you know, that first day of school, there's typically a new teacher, right? And she's got a roster and she's reading down the alphabet. And she got to the S's. And I could tell when they got to my name because they would always stop and look and then i would jump up and say seagull it's seagull right and then by the time i got to high school i'd let them sweat a little bit you know i I wouldn't jump up right away and then by the time i got to college i think i was a little bit um you know a little bit more of a troublemaker i would make them struggle through until they had to spell it out before i i'd give them the the spelling but the the actual pronunciation of my name is polish name and the actual pronunciation is stigov so in in polish um, it's pronounced that way but we just kind of americanized it to seagull just to make it a little bit more simple because it's a bunch of consonants with a few vowels thrown in at the end and and everybody appreciates that because i think the the <laughs> first time that i ever saw it i was like i, I have no idea i'm not even going to attempt this so you uh, said yahtzee right? yeah, exactly well john uh, first of all thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule to be here so for those that may not know who you are give us a pre- brief introduction to, to who john siegel is yeah well great well, i'll start a little bit um a little bit personal and then a little bit of business so i grew up originally in upstate new york so i'm a an upstate New York uh, person by trade. I went to uh, Syracuse University, so that's where I, I went to school um, in uh, political science, economics, kind of a track. I uh, came down to Washington, D.C. in the, in the 80s, yes, way back then. Um, thought I'd be in, in the government. And I, I'll tell a little quick story about how I got in the security industry, only because everybody got into the security industry somehow. And sometimes people wonder how they got in and, and, you know, when they're going to get out. But basically, I answered this ad in the newspaper. I was fresh out of college. I needed a job. And there was an ad that said, market management information systems to executive decision makers. And I thought, I don't know what the heck that is, but I think I can do that. (laughs) So I went on this interview and it turned out um, the job was selling hosted access control systems. Now, mind you, this was 1984. Yeah. And a little company in Rockville, Maryland, Glenn Industrial Communications, um, had some forward linking leading people there, the, the Kruglax, who were the owners of the business. They wanted to start this uh, concept of, of having managed access. And uh, to be candid with you, they were kind of copying Gene Sandberg at Castle at that point, who was also in the market in D.C. and kind of really pioneered this concept of, of, of managed, hosted, managed access control. And so uh, that was my first job. That's how I got into the security industry. Um, from there, I actually was pretty successful in, uh, in moving through the ranks in a, in a bunch of different organizations, uh, ultimately working for a bunch of folks really on the uh, manufacturing side and came to Brevo um about 10 years ago um and in the capacity i'm in today which is you know i have responsibility for uh, the sales teams uh, internationally for brevo and then also 
the uh, product management team, so the, the folks who figure out what we're building, and then also the customer care team. So that that's my uh, that's a little bit about John. Very cool. Well, I I wanted to say a couple things just from from uh, our I guess business relationship. It's been very interesting. Uh, we've been a, a dealer of the Brevo products for uh, I somewhere around twelve thirteen years now, and so during that time. As we were continuing to to kind of understand more and more about the business, I had seen your name, I'd heard your name, but never had any conversation with you. And I think one of the the first time was even just within the last three years, uh, I had an opportunity to meet you face to face at uh, at the summit. And the thing that stood out about that kind of initial face to face meeting was one the fact that you were very receptive and open to conversation and candid in your responses. So I think it's very frequent whenever you're dealing with somebody uh, in in a role like yours that they're going to be very political in their conversation. They're going to be very sh- strategic in what they say and what they don't say. And I felt like whenever uh, you know we we had that conversation, you were very um, open and honest and direct about the, the the conversation that we were having. And so I applaud that and I appreciate that. And it's it stood out to me um, through you know the last couple of years that. You know, I know, I know you have lots of things going on, but I know that as a customer of yours, if ever I have a question, I can keep them minimal. But if I ever have a question, I know that I'm going to get at least a straightforward, non-passive question from you. And so I definitely appreciate that. And that's something that has stood out uh, about uh, about you from one everybody that I've ever spoken with, but from me personally in my interactions with you. So that's been really cool. I appreciate that, Ted. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you know, part of what I believe is, um, you know, of course, every point of view is super important. Um, I learn something every day uh, from all kinds of folks, and so you know, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking about uh, what I don't know as opposed to what I do know, um, and and trying to learn uh, from other people's perspective uh, in that way. Very cool. Well, so a couple of weeks ago, you and I uh, had the, the uh, I guess, privilege to do a webinar to our industry um, uh, regarding some of the impacts on business to, to COVID-19. And whereas I don't know how specific we're going to get into that conversation today, while we were preparing for this through the, the many Zoom meetings, just like we're doing right now, uh, we got into a conversation about kind of business and adapting um and, and I don't want to overuse adapt and pivot, but we, we got into the conversation about how not all, not all business is going downhill. And there are some, some, I don't want to say bright spots, but there's some opportunities within different industries if you open your eyes and kind of look differently. And we were kind of going back and forth about that. And, and it was, I guess it was a little bit on topic for what we were talking about, but it kind of got really more in depth. And I was like, this is something that we need to record a podcast on because I think that this is very eye-opening for a lot of people is, and I was even having a conversation with somebody in our organization earlier today about this, is the economy is, is very tumultuous right now. Like what's going to happen? Nobody knows. But we can either choose, and this is something that I think we all kind of navigate towards, we can either choose to sit there and just go, well, it's, everything's bad, and we, you know, what we've been doing for years is not going to work anymore, or we can say, hold on a second, how can we shift? How can we make adjustments? How can we look in different avenues and be more proactive? And so through that conversation that you, were, and ha- you and I were having, and I know this is a long run-up to a, a question uh, or a statement, but uh, through that conversation that we were having, it it made me understand even more so how attuned you were to just business as a whole and uh, and and how people are working together and not just thinking. It, I think one of the big takeaways I had was you're not just thinking about your particular business. You're having to think about, and maybe this is just uh, something that, that you've been adapted to for a long time, but you're constantly thinking about second, third, and fourth tier business and industries that will ultimately affect yours. So I guess my question, all, all of that statement to lead up to this question is, what makes you think that way? Um, yeah, so it's an interesting question. Um, you know, I, I think maybe it goes back to something uh, that I just said, right, is I always wonder what I don't know. Uh, but then also, to some extent, it's uh, recognizing and having empathy for 
your customers in, in the entire chain. I can remember a, a story, um, this goes, goes way back a number of years, again, in the integration business, but, and I'm sure we've all um, met or worked with people like this, but, you know, we had some folks in, in an organization um, who would complain about the customers, yeah. right? So the, the customers were the problem. And, and I used to have this little joke where I'd say, so this would be an awesome business if we just got rid of all these customers, yeah, right? Yeah. And then it would be great. Um, and I and I threatened a few times to to take a, a copy of like the paycheck, the company paycheck, and then sort of turn it into a puzzle and have all the customers' names written in there and trying to make the point that I don't actually pay you. The yep. customers are paying, right? And so uh, another thing I think, and this is really a, a Brevo philosophy and, a, a, and it resonates well with my own personal philosophies is that there's got to be health through the chain, right? If uh, particularly in the SaaS business. So one of the things when I first came to Brevo in 2009, um, I was doing some research because Steve Antillo had called me and asked me if I, you know, I might be interested in coming on board. And I, I remember reading a white paper that Steve wrote. And, and again, this is, you know, kind of 2009 era. And he used a term in there where he said that Brevo is building a vendor vested relationship with its customers, right? And he was making the point there that in the SaaS business, we're not selling it and then running away. Mm. We're mm. We, the only way we really survive and thrive is to have a super long term relationship with our customers, and and that relationship, of course, can only be built on respect and and, and trust. And so, I think part of that sensitivity in me that wants wants to look at the whole chain and the customer uh, relationship is that I know we're not going to do good, Chad, if your business is not doing. Good. And I know you're not going to do well if your end customers aren't going to do well. And so ultimately, um, to the extent that we can influence that, we need to try to help you know the end customer do well. So an example we were talking about as we jumped on the podcast, the facility safety features that we rolled out, uh, our engineering and product teams were pretty passionate about getting that out because we knew uh, we we're doing something to help people return to work. And presumably helping people return to work, put the economy back into a better shape, put everybody's businesses in better shape. And obviously, Brevo would benefit from that as well. But the, the primary focus is how can, we, you know, how can we help customers? So I think it comes from just that general sense of empathy all the way down uh, the line and um, not being oriented towards creating winners and losers. So some people, I think, are oriented saying, as long as I win, that's good. If you lose, too bad for you. Um, I'm not wired that way. You know, I think uh, win-win is, is ideally a much better scenario um, and, and helps uh, more people that way. Can you copy this key? That's a question we get asked about 3,422 times a year. And how can you actually be sure that the person who asked that question is supposed to get a copy of that key? Well, we think you should always know who can copy your keys to your business and your home because it could be your neighbor, an old employee, a contractor, or even worse, your mother-in-law. At LockDock Security, we believe in protected key systems, so you always know who has a copy of your key. To find out more, visit LockDock.net or stop by our Charlotte location. LockDock Security, helping you protect your people and your property. That's very interesting. Going back to what you were saying at the beginning, um, it, one of my favorite Sam Walton quotes is there's only one boss, the customer, and he can fire everybody in the company from the chairman on down simply by spending his money elsewhere. And that's, that is true. That's, that is a fact that we all have to understand. And if we're thinking in the opposite of that, then we're, we're all going to struggle. But the, the, the point that you're making about understanding your uh, basically multiple tiers down into your customer base, it's, it's something interesting because from a marketing side of things, from a from a from a strategy of connecting with a customer base, that is something that's probably a far stretch, but it's something that I can, I guess, apply my mindset to a lot easier. That if I can provide value towards you know a customer of yours, then ultimately that's going to come back. I get that from the marketing side. When when the economy started to turn, when the pandemic started to come and to affect all of our businesses. I can tell you my initial response was, okay, hold up. Let's look at our information. Let's start watching our numbers. Let's start watching our demand. Let's start watching our quoting processes. And it never occurred to me to think about 
let's look at our customer base and start looking at how they're being affected first. It was just right. it was a, it was an immediate assessment of where we were and to understand our information, which I don't think is 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 bad. I'm just it's interesting and probably short sighted if not if that's not in comparison to your ultimate end user. Well, I think that's natural, right? And you certainly want to do that because in order to understand the reaction that you might need to take, you need to understand what's happening in the business. So we did, we did things pretty similarly. We, you know, we obviously have the capacity to track inbound orders and we also track uh, leading indicators like uh, leads and quotes and all those kind of things in pipeline. Um, we started putting a bit more of a fine point on that and saying, okay, what did that look like on a day-to-day basis as opposed to a weekly or a monthly basis? Um, but, but then I think what happens is that at a point in time, you say, okay, so I, now I have that data, but what am I going to do about it? And I think any manager um, has the responsibility to not only say, These, this is the circumstances that we're in, but is there anything I can do about it? Yeah. Um, and to do something about it, then you've got to get into your customer's shoes and say, how do I help the customer achieve something that they're trying to achieve? Because ultimately, you know, of course, that will result in business for me. Uh, or even if it doesn't, hopefully it will result in a long-term appreciation uh, for the companies, a mutual appreciation between the companies. So, you know, our facility safety features, as an example, rolled out in, you know, literally three weeks um, no charge for any of it. And, um, you know, we, we certainly have heard a lot of good things from, from our customers who appreciate what we did um, and, and helping them try to uh, reopen their businesses. And we believe that, you know, that'll pay dividends just in terms of customer loyalty in the future. And so when, when you think of it that way, though, it, it really kind of puts a lot of things into perspective because, if you're now paying attention to your customers' customers, ultimately, right, then now you can start to understand fluctuation in the market and understand changes in the market better than just sitting back and going, man, our phone stopped ringing. Man, our leads went down. So uh, here, here recently during, during the pandemic, uh, I have tried to spend a lot more time reading and I do a lot of that through audiobooks but I I've, I've ramped up a lot of that information and not because I've had downtime but because I was so tired of just churning the same information over and over again and uh, the four disciplines of execution was a book that I that I've gone through mm-hmm. recently and it talks so much about lead measures uh, versus lag measures and how kind of that impacts your business and with that it it just kind of clicked with me when you were talking is essentially you're focusing on the lead measures for your customers. If if you could figure out what that is, then it starts to direct the future of your business rather than just watching the lag measures, which is, oh, my phone calls have gone down. Yeah, no, nobody arrived anywhere by looking in the rearview mirror, right? <laughs> so you, you got to look out the windshield um, is is the first thing, and then the other thing is, I mean, we and we covered this in the uh, the other session that we. Did is there's always opportunity somewhere. And what one of the, it's a cute little movie if you've ever seen the movie Tin Men. Um, but if you look at the very last scene in Tin Men, and, um, you know, they're, they're kind of, I think it's Danny DeVito, I don't remember who else is in there, but they're, they're walking down the hill and they're sort of bemoaning the fact that, you know, the economy is changing and they're, they're not the same opportunities uh, that they had before, right? And what you see is, I think it's in San Francisco, if I recall correctly, but they're walking. And then what you see is this McDonald's sign being hoisted up in the background and you see a VW bug coming by. Right. And, and the, the subtle uh, message there was, is here are two people walking down the street and they're seeing the next generation of opportunity go right by them. Mm-hmm. And they have a choice to either see it and try to figure out how to capitalize on it mm. or just keep walking down the street about what's in the rearview mirror. So that's one image that's always stuck to me, that last scene in 10 Men as a good example of what to do. Most definitely. Okay, so you've been doing, I, I think, I'm going to make an assumption based off of the conversations we've had. You've been doing a lot of research about exactly what we're talking about, the, the customers of the customers and industries and industry trends and and who's going to be affected by this more than others? Because at the end of the day, you know, we've had this conversation. A lot of times we like to think, paint things with a big, big paintbrush and say, okay, well, everything's down. 
And if you ultimately look at it, grocery stores are, are up, you know, uh, online shopping is up. There's some, there's some areas that are picking up. I was having a conversation the other day with a commercial property manager and he was talking about, yeah, I mean, we're still turning dirt. We're still developing, but the type of properties that we're developing are going to be different. Well, why is that the case based off of a lot of the information that you've been reading? Well, so it's interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, there, th- this idea that there's always opportunity somewhere. So for, first statistic, I think I'd take a look at is if you look at the uh, total square footage by office, by, by building type in the United States, um, the number one building type by square footage is industrial properties. Okay. So that's the first, that's interesting, right? Number two is multifamily. Number three is retail. And number four is office. Okay. Now, most of us spend a lot of our time thinking about office. Yeah. Right? Um, and, and that may be because, generally speaking, retail is not perceived to have, you know, the type of security systems that we deploy. And they, they do have systems, but maybe not exactly, you know, what we're most um, interested in. Um, but the point there is that there's at least um, two markets that are bigger than both retail and um, and office that are multifamily and industrial. And when you look at what's happened um, with COVID and, and all of the changes uh, to virtualization, so we're on a you know kind of a Zoom session right now, right? So any of those kind of businesses that are uh, automated like that, uh, telecom related, hosting related, all 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 growing. Um, they need space, right? So you need spaces for data centers, you need spaces for uh, warehousing and logistics and shipping equipment. When you have uh, a 300% increase in the delivery of alcohol, um, uh, the places where that people have to have that stored, it's got to be close to the customer. So industrial space is one that I think everybody should be looking at as, a, as an opportunity uh, and that will continue to grow. And even if I look at office, you know, depending on who you listen to, some people say, well, the, the office as it is, traditional office is dead. Uh, then you have other people saying, well, it's, it's not dead, but it's probably going to change for a little bit, right? And, and one um, idea that I have, I don't know whether this would be right, is that um, even if the office changes and there are more people working from home, assuming we have to practice the social distancing for some period of time, the actual square footage in the space probably becomes less efficient. So where uh, for the last few years, everybody's been focused on this open office concept and people are really happy sitting at picnic tables effectively right next to each other, uh, they may not want to do that going forward. And so we end up uh, potentially using the same amount of square footage of space uh, you know, for, for the, those people. But the other thing that I think we've already seen, so this pattern is not uh, new, but you know, we saw the huge rise of WeWork and co-working and shared office space. Yep. And I think you'll continue to see that more, that the office building owners have determined that um, the, the, share, the co-working short-term rental model is a good model. And uh, there are a lot of people who are looking just for turnkey office, meaning I don't want to have to worry about architecture and design and all those kind of things. I want to just roll in and pay a rent and have a amount of square feet. So I think all of that's just going to continue to change and evolve and be reshaped. And there will be plenty of opportunities in there for uh, security folks. Um, the other one uh, just kind of goes in the industrial space, uh, industrial slash retail maybe, is the cannabis industry. Mm-hmm. Giant boom in that industry, you know, kind of right along with the alcohol stuff. Uh, and those opportunities will just continue to, uh, to, to be generated. Hey, thanks for listening to the Coffee Break Podcast. If this information has been helpful to you or you just really kind of like our theme song, can you help us out by rating us on whatever app you're using? And if you get really fancy, how about sharing a screenshot on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn? Okay, enough of all this. Let's get back to the conversation. It's it's interesting. So the the individual I was having a conversation with the other day it said almost verbatim what you were talking about is just because a, a, a business has 20,000 foot of office space and it's mostly open office, they may not shrink down that 20,000 square foot. They may just, instead of it being open office, go in and start putting up temporary walls and actually take that, you know, if they had uh, uh, whatever it would be, 100 people in that office, now they take it down to 50 people, but they're all in individual offices rather than the open environment. 
Um, and so I think that there's more conversations about that. And for our business, that's great because that's more doors, right? Like that's something that right. we, we have to focus on. But um, I think that's probably the reason why uh, probably integrators or installers or locksmith companies like us are focused more on that office space, that fourth category, because it's, you know, it, there's a lot of doors there. But I think the point that you're making and, and the point or the takeaway that I've gotten from these conversations is just because that is appealing because there's a higher volume of doors or openings there for us. Now the larger space and the security demands of the other type of facilities are now increasing and improving based off of regulations that they're going to have. So it's just taking your eyes off of this direction and shifting it over to a different direction even if you're doing the same thing. So uh, I think the, the conversation that we've had a lot is adapting and pivoting, adapting and pivoting. Yeah. What's, your, what's your pivot? And for a lot of us in, in a business model where you know, we, we have to turn screws in order to, to generate revenue, it may not be pivoting into the fact of how do we miraculously not turn screws anymore, but how do we pivot into a different industry model than what we currently are, are saturated in? So when, when, I, when you're talking with other companies and when you're talking with other uh, industries, how are you understanding or what are you reading that says, hey, this is the, the best way? How do, you, how do you understand where you are and how do you understand where you want to shift to? Yeah, well, it's a good question. So that for me, the past is always prologue, right? That um, you, you, can, you can see the future in many cases by looking at the past. And sometimes the past has occurred in different industries. So um, one of the things that you know, I've been saying for years about the security industry, and this is having been an integrator, of course, is that um, when there's relatively um, easy money, let's say, you know, when there's a lot of projects, um, it's it, the the installation market is a good market, right? So getting a project, installing a bunch of, of a technology, making it all work, uh, you know, you get you can get paid pretty well to do that. But in a down market, there might be less of that, and then all of a sudden the question is, okay, what's my value add here? Uh, what can I do differently? And so I think if you look at uh, the IT space, I mean. Typically, the security industry has trailed the IT and the computer uh, industry by some number of years. It used to be five. You know, sometimes I think it's longer. <laughs> it seems longer um, that we're, we're following behind. But one of the things that IT um, VARs uh, found out a number of years ago was that um, the, there was huge pressure on the hardware because as the hardware in some cases became more sophisticated or, you know, for take a Cisco router, for example, it required a set of special knowledge. It required a bunch of customer settings that were unique to that customer. So by definition, the customer had to have a high level of expertise on that particular set of hardware to deploy their network. And so that kind of pushed the value of the computer integrators down a bit, right? Because the customer then became a little bit of an expert and, um, they, in some cases, became just installers, right? They, they pulled wire, they put in hardware, and then the customer um, configured things. And, and so what surprises me sometimes today is the amount to which, um, you know, the integrators don't really leverage their knowledge base and don't fully uh, bring to the table for their customers uh, sort of the policy and implementation guidance that they could. You know, most customers have uh, been involved with implementing and operating a handful of access control systems or a handful of video systems. The integrators have been involved with implementing hundreds, thousands of systems, right? They've seen good ways of doing it, bad ways of doing it, good implementations, poor implementations. So I think one of the pivots that the IT industry made 10 years ago is to say, you know, we're going to have to live on 5 or 8% gross margins for hardware. And I'm not suggesting that security industry is there today, but you're seeing evidence of that. You're seeing evidence in the hardware that's going through distribution. You're seeing evidence of that in customers who are buying direct from manufacturers. You're seeing evidence of that in the new uh, kind of, let's call them Silicon Valley uh, companies who are selling directly to the end user and then uh, attempting to pull the integrator in later mm -hmm. um, and say, hey, can you install this thing? So some um, early signs of those changes are, are happening. 
And I think what a savvy integrator will do is say, okay, what are the services and things that are unique that require a little bit more brain power that my customer uh, may need? And so I'll just give you a couple of examples. And these are things that I believe the, the IT industry went through the same evolution and they've done as well as uh, policy related things. You know, how many times have we installed a security system and then told the customer, it kind of works this way. Good luck. Here's your, here's your login. Um, what if you spent the time saying, let's develop your access control policy. Let's decide, um, rather than giving everybody a 24 by 7 credential, let's decide what groups your employees should be in, what groups there should be in the system. Let's talk about what happens on a snow day or in an emergency. You know, how do you respond? Uh, who does what within your organization to actually keep the building secure? And in that way, you're, you're functioning a little bit more like a consultant uh, for the end user. You're bringing uh, both your technical knowledge as well as your system skills to bear. And uh, presumably, you're um, providing that for a labor rate that's um, equal to or higher than what you would get to just you know, simply install some technology. But the point is, you've made that transition from installer to trusted advisor. Uh, for the customer. And I think that's the position that people want to be in. That's a position that um, the secure, the um, IT bars have made it through that transition. And and they're, you know, let's say selling products that might be at a low margin. The hardware is still low margin, uh, but they sell a whole bunch of value added service configuration services, API services um, that are at, at much better margins that can really support a healthy business because they've made the transition over to that side of the that is very interesting, I, and I, I that's a that is a great example of something that everybody can start thinking about. Okay, hold on a second. You know, if if this avenue shuts off, or if that's not going to be the usual, what are ways to adapt? And it's to pr- continue to provide services that are applicable to what you're already doing, but just take it up a whole another lot notch where we typically uh, you know install and leave. Now we're continuing to create that relationship in more of a consultant vibe, less than uh, just the installer. Absolutely. Very interesting. John, I want to honor your time because I know you've got many more Zoom calls to uh, to attend. So uh, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for your insights. I, I look forward to uh, connecting with you more in the future. The one thing that I did notice is that you're missing uh, a lock dock uh, coffee I, break. I coffee absolutely cup. need that. Yeah, I, I, have my, uh, I have my Brevo. Yep. Uh, but oh, I wow. don't have a lock doc. Yeah. Well, we'll do a we'll do a mug swap. But I will, we can do that. Uh, I will get one to you so you can sit on your uh, your counter there in the back behind you and on your window still so that Appreciate it'll be there for that. all you your. Know, I'll take, take one thing. That little picture back there. Um, I want to say it's from Peru, and it's a picture of a sign in Spanish, right? But it, it's one of the other things that I say I always like to take forward. And basically, what it says is. The way forward is difficult, but not impossible, is what that sign says. There you go. And and uh, I I always I always think you know that's also a good way to think about things. Um, pivoting and and change is is potentially difficult, but it's not impossible. I like it. I, I one of uh, one of our guys here says frequently. Uh, a challenge is an opportunity to succeed. And if you keep that mindset, you know, the way forward is difficult, but it's not impossible. It's something that is a great reminder and it would be something to to make sure that you're set and focused on every single day. So again, thank you for your time. It was good to chat with you. Just a reminder, you're listening to the Coffee Break Podcast. Also, we wanted to let you know that our team puts together a weekly blog post. You can find it at locdoc.net slash blog. It's guaranteed to raise your IQ by 12 points or your money back. So it's pretty much a win-win. All right, back to the conversation. Hey, John, thanks again for your time today. Uh, It's always a blast to chat with you, and it's been really cool to be able to chat with you over the last couple of weeks as we've been preparing for uh, our webinar. And hey, for those of you who are watching or listening for the first time, we've got tons more information just like this this. Actually, uh, within the last couple of weeks, we were just talking about project management and how project management affects your your business operations. We talked about uh, the payroll protection program a couple of weeks back and just a lot of other insights that are applicable to your business. If this is your first time listening to this or watching this, we want to invite you to check out all the other episodes we have. You can simply go to lockdoc.net slash podcast. That's L-O-C-D-O-C.net slash podcast. 
And you could also see the video version of this on Facebook and YouTube. Just go search for LOC, DOC, and you'll see a ton of videos there that you can check out. It's all available, all the links, so you can subscribe. It's all there for you at LOCDOC.net slash podcast. Thank you very much for watching and listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Coffee Break Podcast.